Well, this, this is quite a turnout. We're very pleased to be here. I'd like to start by seating the chair, the seat, to Justice Abramson, who has a few remarks she'd like to make about Congressman Kastenmeier. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Barbara and I uh, first met at this law school. She was a senior graduating and I was sort of hanging around. And uh, so we met and became friends then and have continued our friendship through practice of law in Madison. She practiced in on the, I think it was the 10th floor of the Tenney Building and I was on the fifth floor. So you can see she rose faster than <laughs> I did. And uh, we've been buddies ever since, joined the uh, benches, federal and state, uh, roughly together, and um, see each other at law school and other events, and um, good friends with her husband, Ted Crabb, who I have to tell you, and I think Barbara knows, sends me a Valentine card <laughs> <laughs> every February 14th. <laughs> And my husband did not. <laughs> <laughs> he would express amazement every year <laughs> and say, I forgot. <laughs> what can you do with him? So we're delighted to, to be uh, here. And um, we are delighted, uh, too, because of our mutual friend, uh, Bob Kastemeyer and his valuable contributions to both the federal and state court systems. Um, Bob's uh, distinguished career uh, began in Congress and lasted from 58 to 1990. It was marked by his dedication to promoting and improving the rule of law and the administration of justice. Most congressmen are not devoted or committed <laughs> to uh, the judicial uh, system, uh, and, uh, but Bob was and uh, uh, watched uh, the Congress with the federal judicial system. And he was interested in the state court system because Bob knew that you know, over 90% of the cases are in the state court system and that a good state court system was important for a good federal system. And so uh, he did what he could at various times to uh, support the state court system, including uh, getting uh, funding for a state justice institute, which then funded various research programs and um, uh, experimentation in judicial administration in the state court system. So these are very important. Uh, uh, to us, um, and so important that in 1988, the American Judicature Society, which is essentially com uh, committed to promoting state court systems, gave him their award. And they, uh, he's, he, in accepting the award, summed up the goals of the justice system as follows. <coughs> Quote, at the outset, let us agree upon the primary goals of this nation's justice system. First, we should assure access to justice for all citizens. Good, we should assure access of justice to all citizens. Impediments to justice resulting from our unique system of government based on separation of power and federalism should be reduced. We should improve the quality of personnel, judges, and court employees in the federal judicial branch and promote citizen participation in the justice system. And fourth, he said, we should increase experimentation and improve research on the administration of justice. I'm sure Barbara joins me in commending him for these four goals and saying they're still important. His commitment to justice 
extended not only to the federal courts, but to the state courts. He understood that over 95% of this country's judicial business is conducted in state courts. He was instrumental in the creation and funding of the State Justice Institute, which continues to be an important factor in research and experimentation in improving the quality of justice in the courts. In short, we in the judiciary, as well as all the other citizens of the state, owe a debt of gratitude to Baum Kastenmeier. And with that in mind, I'm pleased to participate with Barbara Crabb in this event which bears his name, and long may it bear his name. Thank you. I, I was telling Shirley that when I first started as a judge, we just took it for granted that Bob Kastenmeyer would stop by maybe, maybe once a year on a Saturday morning, we'd all be in the courthouse and he'd come and he'd say, so how are things going? What, are you, what kinds of problems are you seeing? What, what are the legal issues that are arising? And we'd talk about it and he would join in and he would have ideas and suggestions and questions. And after he lost the last election, nobody's ever asked us anything again. <laughs> uh, we just, we just operate in a little you know, sphere by ourselves, which is not necessarily the best way to arrange things, I think. The days when judges and people from Congress could talk about problems of the courts was an important aspect, but it's, we don't have it much anymore. I'll see you on Saturday. <laughs> right. Now, a little bit about Justice Abramson, who truly needs no introduction, but I will say that she grew up in New York City. You might not have ever guessed that from her accent. <laughs> she was the daughter of immigrants, Leo and Celia Schlanger, who ran a small neighborhood grocery store, and her first language was Yiddish, but she quickly learned English and then taught it to her parents. Those parents believed in education and encouraged her and her sister to go on to college. Shirley earned an undergraduate degree from New York University, taking a good three years to finish a four-year <laughs> commitment. She followed that up with three years of law school at Indiana University. She chose Indiana because her husband, Seymour, whom she married in 1953, was working on his doctorate in the zoology department there. The two of them continued westward, where Seymour began his career at the University of Wisconsin, becoming an internationally respected geneticist who specialized in the biological effects of atomic radiation. And also there, Shirley embarked on her legal career. She began with a doctorate in American legal history, working with legal historian Willard Hurst, whom some of you may know, remember. She went on to a partnership at the La Follette, Seneca, Doyle, and Anderson Law Firm. While at the firm, she gave birth to her son Daniel, the exceptional Daniel, who is now married and the parent of Moses, another very smart and talented Abramson. She left the firm in 1976, when Governor Patrick Lucy appointed her to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. She liked it enough that she's never left. Um, I did want to ask you a question, Justice Abramson. One of your colleagues, Justice Ann Walsh Bradley, suggested that I start by asking you to tell the story of how you got your library card. <laughs> Well, at that time, uh, we were living in Union City, New Jersey, which we viewed as uh, an outpost of New York City, <laughs> where we ordinarily lived. And so I went to the library, as I had in New York City, and um, asked for a card, and was asked uh, 
to um, have my parent who owned property in the community sign for a card. Well, my parents didn't own real estate and they didn't own personal property. My father operated a grocery store and I don't think they viewed the cans of uh, Gringy Peas <laughs> as a property to be used for a library card. That really was quite a, an event for me because I was embarrassed that I might not be able to get a library card. And how do you live, how do I live without a library card? And um, I, described all this at home to my folks who were quite distressed, which put us down. I, I have only one dislike in life, and it's New Jersey. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give me a library card. And so um, we had to go to my, the landlord of the grocery store and get him to sign for a library card and and he got as much from my folks as he could <laughs> to get his signature on a request for a library card that's how i got a library card and so i view um impediments of ownership of property for basic needs like a library card with askance <laughs> You should know that about me, so if you've got a case, <laughs> deal <laughs> with it. I've heard you say that you wanted to be a lawyer from the time you were six. Along the way, did you have any other thoughts about what you might want to be, or did you hew to that line? Never had another idea of what I should be. I don't think I had any talent to do anything else. <laughs> And if I didn't Was there anybody in particular who influenced you in that way? How did you know about lawyers? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know a lawyer. My family didn't have a lawyer. They were too poor. Uh, and somehow I got it into my head I should be a lawyer. And it's a good thing I had something in my head <clears throat> because I, never, I don't think I have any other talent. So I cho it chose me right. It, I heard that the dean of the Indiana Law School, who was, of course, the dean when you graduated, and you graduated very high in your class, that he was very pessimistic about the chances of your ever finding a job. Yep. We had a conversation. He called me in and as I was in my third year and about to finish and said, um, that he was, he usually placed the person who was first in the class with the uh, largest leading law firm in Indianapolis, but that um, he could not place me in that law firm. And I said, that was okay, because I didn't want to go to Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> so we were even. <laughs> uh, and, but, they just weren't going to hire a woman. And it didn't matter where in the law class she sat and what her talents were aside from the grades, just wasn't gonna hire a woman. And so um, I don't know that I would have gotten a job uh, in, uh, in Indiana. And there was a man who taught as an adjunct professor at the law school and uh, he needed someone to help in the law firm, but uh, he wouldn't hire me because people would talk. I said, I thought that was a pretty good idea. <laughs> uh, but uh, he didn't see it that way, so it was very difficult. But tell me about working with Willard Hurst, which was more pleasant. Yes. Well, uh, most of you probably have had not had not have contact with Willard Hurst, but Willard was um, a, a native of Rockford, Illinois, graduated Harvard Law School, 
uh, came to um, Madison and taught at the uh, law school, and he taught uh, legislation and um, legal history. And I came to the law school and I took both of his courses and they were excellent. He was an excellent teacher and just a wonderful gentleman. Uh, and uh, so that was my entrance into Wisconsin. And I went to Willard when I finished. Uh, I came for a year, didn't finish for the year. My husband and I went back to New York City area and then we both came back for me to finish. And uh, that was a time when my husband decided we were not going back to New York City. That was not my choice. <laughs> I, uh, we had, this was one of our major disputes in marriage. And uh, like in ma all our marriage major disputes, I won and we stayed in Madison. <laughs> so, that's And then what you worked with Willard. For over a year, and that was really a wonderful experience. He was a great editor and a researcher and uh, fun to work with, and he and his wife, Frances, and uh, Seymour and I became great friends and good times. So how did you end up practicing with La Follette, Sinek, and Doyle, and Anderson? Well, it was time to leave the womb <laughs> and uh, go out into the cold, cruel world into which I had never been. I'd only been in school and working uh, with Willard. And so I went to Willard and I said, you know, I could spend hours and days knocking on doors and uh, I'm not going to get anywhere. And getting a job, this is 1956-7 era. Uh, so why don't we just cut to the chase and figure out where, where will there be an opportunity for me? At least they'll look at me. And uh, Willard said, well, I think there are two places. One is the La Follette, Sinek and Doyle office. I think they would look at you for merit and if they have an opportunity, but it's a small office, so not much opening. And the other place would be the Attorney General's office. Uh, John Reynolds, who then became governor of the state, was uh, Attorney General and said, John Reynolds will uh, look at merit. And so um, I said, well, I'll do that. And I called uh, John Reynolds' office and went to see him. And uh, I don't know how many of you know him, but he was just a wonderful, wonderful gentleman and a good lawyer and fun, uh, good Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so John interviewed me and said, okay, we have an opening, we'll get you in here. I said, don't you have a system here? <laughs> he said, no. yeah, we have a system, we'll get you in. <laughs> no problem, we have a system. So I said, okay, well, we'll try the system and it sounds like this would be a good place for me. And I said, I do have one other place I'm going to interview, and it's at the La Follette firm. And he said, okay, say hi to Jim Doyle for me and the rest of the boys uh, in the firm. And so I went to the La Follette firm and um, interviewed with them and um, waited and waited and waited and waited. And finally, I mean, six to eight weeks passed by, and I thought, my God. They could at least say no, that would be <laughs> polite. And they called and said yes. So then I had two jobs. There's always a problem, you know. Can't be simple, get one job, finish it. So then I had to decide, do I take what viewed to me was a safe bet of the state government? It was a secure job, I would not be discriminated against on the basis of gender and 
Uh, it would be interesting work. And, the, and one of the best law firms in the state at that time, and I think this is still true, was the Attorney General's office. They have first-rate lawyers. Or do I take the chance of going with, with a relatively small firm, uh, not established as such, uh, no uh, high-paid retaining clients, you know, whatever you earn that month, that's what you spent. Uh, and so it was security or take a chance. And I am not a risk taker, so I took a chance. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I don't view myself as a risk taker. Everybody else views me as a risk taker. <laughs> not me. Anyway, it wasn't much of a risk. Uh, I took the job uh, with the LaFollette firm, and, and it was an excellent experience. They, um, they had interesting cases, and they put me right to work on it, not just writing briefs, which I did my fair, more than my fair share of. Um, but, um, so that was my experience with uh, La Follette, and, and it, was a, it was a good one, and that's where we met again. Right, and I, I wanna tell you what Gordon Sinekin did when he was hiring a woman for the firm. He had a full page of pictures in the Wisconsin State Journal, I think it was the State Journal, might have been the Cap Times, of Shirley Abramson walking her dog, going to court, doing all of these things. So it was a big deal, a big deal, that this woman was coming to this firm. And he also, ahead of time, would talk to his clients, he would say, you know, I've hired a woman who's really very, very smart, very good lawyer. And if you are the right kinds of clients, you will be able to work with her. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He turned what was um, lemons into, <laughs> lemon, into and lemonade, lemonade and did right. it very, very wisely. And, and so by the time I got there, the clients really behaved with me because <laughs> they didn't want to lose me on their team. <laughs> right. So in addition to working at that firm, you also taught. I did. I taught uh, first in the, um, the program on how to be a lawyer and love it. Uh, and then um, afterwards, uh, I taught at uh, tax. I also taught trust in estates one year. Jim McDonald wanted to do something and he had started teaching trust in estates and he needed someone to take over the course so he could go abroad or whatever the devil he was doing. So I did it. It was fun. And because you were such a good tax lawyer, people wanted to talk to you about taxes. So I've always heard that you were responsible, unwittingly, for the opening up of the Madison Club to females. <laughs> My greatest accomplishment. <laughs> well, your I, most expensive one. <laughs> and My most expensive one, which is continuing expense. The Madison Club, M Madison was very different then. Uh, there were very few places uh, to eat lunch and be in a quiet room so you could have a meeting. And the one place that did have quiet rooms and meeting places and lunch was the Madison Club. There was just one little problem, and that was he, they did not allow women to be members unless your husband, your deceased husband was a member or your father or relative. And so I uh, couldn't get into the Madison Club. And one day, which was really hampering my style, <laughs> and one day uh, a group of uh, lobbyists 
took me out to lunch because they wanted to hire me to do something for them. And they uh, said, we're going to go to the Madison Club. And I thought to myself, uh-oh. <laughs> I, I said, fine. And uh, so they walked into the front entrance and was stopped and said, since I was with them, they'd have to go in the side entrance. <laughs> that was a little embarrassing for them. And then uh, when we got to through the side entrance, they found out that they couldn't eat there because women couldn't eat lunch at the Madison Club at that time. On Saturdays. Oh, and so was that a Saturdays? Yeah. It was, so that was a little embarrassing for them too. Now what do we do? Uh, it, it didn't go well. But I went well with that. And uh, the result was they wrote a letter to the Madison Club about how, why they couldn't get in. And it hit the newspapers, of course. That's always something which the Madison Club, uh, it's a wonderful letter I have from the Madison Club that says, we don't discriminate against anyone. Uh, and uh, the dining room is open on Saturdays to women. <laughs> it was one of these disclaimers uh, letters which I framed <laughs> because it's so good. And that opened the Madison Club. And, and I have to tell you that the... Ma and, and, and I'm still a member of the Madison Club, had great expense to me. I never eat there. <laughs> <laughs> but you feel you have to keep your but membership? But I have to keep my membership. <laughs> I mean, I made such a big deal out of this thing. <laughs> I have to keep my membership. And so I, the check goes out every month, and I think, God, I so. shouldn't be a person of principle. <laughs> now, how did you get appointed to the Supreme Court? You know, I don't know, um, and I never asked Pat Lucy. I just figured I better not know. <laughs> but um, Pat Lucy had several appointments, and there were several openings in the Supreme Court. And it's my personal view that he appointed all the Democrats that he owed something to and that he wanted to. And then he got down to the next appointment. And uh, he didn't know anybody anything. And so it took him a while. It was a long time coming. But he appointed me. And there had never had been a woman on the court before. And um, I was not uh, a good Democrat. Uh, in fact, he lost a couple of friends because they objected to my appointment because I had supported a Republican for the, for the court one year. Everybody makes a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, he uh, appointed me, but he really did use up all his friends, and et cetera, and he said he would do that. Pat Lucy was a, a mar if you didn't know him, he was really a marvelous guy. Um, he was a f client of Jim Doyle's when Jim Doyle practiced law, and I was in a law firm with Jim Doyle, but I didn't know Pat Lucy then. But uh, he was uh, just a good citizen. If I can tell you one story. Um, That's what we're here for. Okay. <laughs> um, there was, there was a, a lot of protests in Madison. I've forgotten why, but there's always a lot of protests in Madison. And there was a political protest in Madison. And uh, they turned violent very quickly and very badly. Um, and uh, people came to see me. It's always unclear to me why people come to see me, but they knock on the door and I let them in, and that's where the trouble begins. <laughs> And they wanted Pat Lucy to open up some of his property so they could have a vegetable garden the following day, start a vegetable garden, and 
get everybody off the protests into the vegetable garden. And uh, would I help? And I said, I don't know Pat Lucy. And they said, well, he's Jim Doyle's client. You must have met him. So I said, oh, sure, I met him. Anyway, so it's 6 o'clock at night, and I'm now on a ride to Maple Bluff. Uh, and we're going to go see Pat Lucy and ask him to open up his property for a vegetable garden <laughs> so we don't have protests the following Saturday. So I knock on the door and somebody answers and I said, I'm Shirley Abrahamson, could I see Pat Lucy, please? And uh, so they let me in and Mr. Lucy uh, came into the drawing room and we chatted and I said, they think if we opened up this property for everybody to come on Saturday and plant a vegetable garden and sing songs and <laughs> hold hands and everything, then we'd, there'd be peace in Madison on Saturday. And I think all oh, this is a little strange, Mr. Lucy, and I'm not coming here to tell you I endorse it because I don't. I think it's nonsense, uh, but I agreed to be their spokesperson. And he said, okay. I said, Mr. Lucy, if you let people on your property to do what they want on your property, what do you think the chances are that they're gonna leave that property and give that property back to you? He said, I don't know. I said, I don't think the chances are very good. <laughs> I mean, as your advisor at the moment, I don't think they're very good, so I think you're taking a risk. And this property is adjacent to two or three other parcels you own, Mr. Lucy, as I understand it. And he said, that's right. And I said, and you need all of these parcels if you're going to do what you want to do on that property, as I understand the situation. He said, that's right. I said, well, if you don't get that parcel back, you've lost the value of the other parcels. He said, that's right. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, he's a good businessman, but I, it's strange to me. I mean, this is not what I would have advised him to do at all. And he did it. We went on to the property the next day. Everybody had a good time. They left the property that night, never to return. <laughs> I was dead wrong. And uh, he got the property back and ultimately built on it, and et cetera. But it's a guy who thought it was more important to take a chance and keep the peace in, in Madison than to worry about whether he's going to make another few bucks on another piece of property. And never said that, never blinked, just did it. And uh, I had great, great uh, confidence in him, and I felt very good about uh, dealing with him on that. Needless to say, he became my hero when he appointed me. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you became chief 20 years later, what kind of priorities did you have as chief? Did you come in with any, or had you be, been thinking about them? Well, I don't know that I came in with any, but there's always something swirling around in the head. Um, the, uh, the court was not active in terms of administration. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the case came in, we did, it was put on the docket, we did the case, and we went on to the next case, et cetera. But the, whole, the concept that the Supreme Court was, was the head of the judicial, the entire state judicial system was not high in the minds of the justices uh, or of the uh, trial judges. I mean, they were all kings and they were kings in the uh, in their uh, fiefdom, and um, 
So uh, when I became Chief Justice, I thought, well, this is a, supposed to be a system, and uh, we should look at it as a system. And so I started doing things that would, would give the trial judges power within the system, but also to look at it as a system and uh, do things that were helpful to uh, the uh, to the people who wanted to use it, and and that we we stress access, access to justice. So you were responsible for some innovations. I Is hope so. Taking the court on the road. Yeah. One thing, this is part of access. Uh, we always sat in, uh, in Madison, uh, and when I got on the court, I had suggested to the chief that maybe we should sit one, at least one month in another part of the state. And he said, well, the Constitution says we sit at the seat of the government. And I said, the government seat is wherever we sit. <laughs> he said no <laughs> but um, we did and and the the uh, gov uh, the governor had started moving around the state and sitting and if the governor is supposed to sit at the seat of government and can sit in Warsaw no offense to Justice uh, Ann Walsh Bradley from Warsaw uh, then we can sit there, it took a it took a few. It always takes a few years. So start soon. <laughs> start right away. What else? What else did you do? <laughs> Nothing I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so, what aspects of your job have you most enjoyed? Well, I enjoy oral argument, and uh, because I think it's it's interesting to um, experiment with ideas from the case. Where does it lead if you go this way? Where does it lead if you go this way? What's good for the particular ligands? What's good for the, for the state? Uh, but I also enjoy uh, uh, going out and uh, talking to groups, so I have done quite a bit of that all yes. around the state to talk about the state courts and what we do and what we don't do and what they should be watching for. I think that's fun. So that would be an aspect of the job that you've enjoyed, what mm -hmm. other ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I enjoy writing opinions. I, I enjoy writing opinions once I can figure out what I want to do and that it works. It's not so much fun when I'm uh, struggling to figure out what works and what doesn't work and what, what we should put in I, an I think all judges would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were going to set guidelines or expectations for su Supreme Court justices, what might they be? I, w I would set guidelines of looking not only at the state court law, but looking at, at law across the globe, looking at law from other jurisdictions, foreign jurisdictions, and looking at, at uh, administrative matters that they do that are helpful to the people as such, and then adapt them and adopt them in Wisconsin. One thing I found, I was, I tend to go around the state and I usually go to the clerk's office who usually says, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I say, I'm Shirley Abramson. And um, they say, okay, what do you want? I said, <laughs> well, I'm, I thought I'd use your public computer. Okay, it's over there. Um, and so, of course, these computers all work differently if they work at all. 
and uh, so we, we get into this kind of kind of conversation and then get into a conversation of what she thinks her job is as clerk mm -hmm. and what kind of help she should or shouldn't be giving to people who come in. These are tough questions, you know, they're not supposed to practice law. Right. And, and they're not supposed to advise them as such, but, you know, they need help. So we have interesting conversations about that. That's what I do in my spare time. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you have something to do in your spare time. <laughs> well, you don't want me walking the streets, right? <laughs> right. What, what do you think, what do you, if you were picking a great judge, what qualities would that person have? Well, I don't want to describe me, right? <laughs> You're I'll free to any you. description you want. <laughs> I want the judge to be learned in the law. I think that's important. But I expect the judge to understand the effect of a decision on the individual and on the family. You can't throw a case, you know, to make it fit that individual and the family. But you can um, you can keep them in mind and put it in the picture. So I want a judge to not only see the case for that individual in the family, but I wanted the judge to see the case for the system. That you're making a rule of law that will fit the system and do justice for the system as well as for that individual. I think that's important. So a there's going to be a little compassion is good. What? A little compassion. <laughs> yes. Is good. Um, the next generation of judges is going to have challenges and opportunities. What, what do you see that they might be, those challenges? Well, one of the challenges and opportunities, and I view this as good, is that there'll be much more diversity um, in, the in the judicial branch. Uh, right now, uh, well, if you look past 10 or 15 or 20 years, you had um, all white males. Now, there's nothing the matter with white males. <laughs> Most of them are okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, you want the, the judiciary to be an opportunity for others. And, and you've got much more diversity at the law schools now. And that's great. And because you can't be a judge in Wisconsin unless you're a lawyer. So more diversity in the law school. And I, by diversity, I mean everything. Age and ethnic background and ideology. Um, so I think that we're going to see that in the judiciary. Right now we have quite a number of women judges, uh, but you know, you, you still can count them in the numbers of, on your hands. Mm -hmm. Might need a couple of feet, but <laughs> um, yeah, you do that. And I've always said that if I could name all the women judges in Wisconsin, there aren't enough. Well, I can't name them all, but I can come very close, so there's still not enough mm -hmm. uh, on, on diversity. And I think that's very important because the bench should look like, the bench and the legal profession should look like the clients and have an understanding of their backgrounds. Doesn't mean you have to accept it, but have an understanding of it. What advice would you give to law students or young lawyers that you wish someone had given to you? Well, some of the advice given to me was really very bad. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, you're not going to get anywhere. Or no one's going to hire you. Pardon me? And, or no one's going to hire you. Yeah, no one's going to hire you. Who's going to hire you? Um, it's just bad advice. There's always a sucker <laughs> that'll hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and we had good hires, Barbara. 
went to one very, very good law firm in Madison the same time I went to another one. And I think we probably the only two women in Madison who were in law practice who weren't related by blood or marriage to another lawyer in the firm. So we did okay, Barbara. Not, not you too well, but that's <laughs> <laughs> we did okay. And uh, I think that's, I, I wouldn't let people discourage you. I just, just don't let them put you down or put your that's future down. That's good advice. Down. That's not, very good do advice. Do not let them do that. If you can't tease them out, kick them out. You just can't let them do that to you. So, and and they're not they're not doing it because they're mean. They're doing it because they don't know any better. They just don't know any better. What what was one of the hardest cases you ever had to decide? As a judge, definitely as a judge. <laughs> <laughs> they're all hard until I decide them. <laughs> Once. I've decided it, and it writes. That's the important mm -hmm. thing, and it writes. That's the acid test. Does it write that is persuasive to you and to the reader? And you can make any opinion persuasive if you omit all the hard facts, and you omit all the hard law that's against you, and you just write <laughs> the clean facts and the legal principles that are with you. But that's cheating to me. A good opinion uh, looks at the hard facts that are against you, the, opinion, the position you're going to take, and explains why you're going to do it. You take your position anyway, and explains away, in one fashion or other, the law that, that you're not governing in this case. And if you, can do, you should do that honestly, both honestly. And when it's done honestly and it's persuasive, you know you've got a good opinion and you know you've got a good decision. Anyway, that's my test for doing that. It, someone at, at, at my stage, someone at a higher level might disagree, but I could still feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've always been known for your willingness to travel anywhere at any time. Right, have suitcase packed. <laughs> and Sometimes you go because it advances some aspect of the law, some organization. Sometimes you go just for fun and adventure, and I've heard that you've been on all seven continents. Is that Absolutely. true? Absolutely. But on, on the, um, in the Antarctic, I had nobody to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> but those penguins are fun. <laughs> So rumor has it also that you've performed marriages in a wide variety of venues, including, I haven't checked this out, but I've been told that you did one on a float in the Milwaukee Circus Parade. Absolutely. <laughs> Timed it so it started at the beginning of the parade and ended at the end of the parade. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but fun. I like to do weddings, by the way. And, and I'm a really good um, wedding person, because <laughs> my price is right. <laughs> <laughs> do you think there are any differences in the challenges faced by young women lawyers today that are different from the ones that you and I faced? I think so. And this may surprise you. I think that um, with the f that although you and I face challenges, and but we were singles. That is, mm -hmm. it was one of us, two of us, three of us. We were we really weren't so frightening. Pardon me. <laughs> we weren't so threatening or that frightening. Exactly. <laughs> right. We weren't a threat. Hey, the two of us, we couldn't take the whole male bar. We were no threat. <laughs> we could take up two, two jobs, max. And if the guys were lucky, 
we'd have children and leave, right? Now, women are uh, graduating at half the law school and, and are quickly uh, filling the ranks of the, bar, of, the, uh, of the bar. I think we're up to, what, 25 to 30, 35 percent. Um, and that is a much greater threat to uh, white males who had 100% of the job opportunities before we crowded them out. And I think that, that should, you have to recognize that, that uh, the more diversity you get, the more um, uh, is a threat to those who had 100% of the opportunities before. But um, I think that uh, everybody has to recognize that there's room for all of us, or should be, and that the only way you're going to beat us out is being by better. So we are going to make the bar better. Because <laughs> you're going to have to work harder. Yeah. And um, I think that having um, people with diverse interests and diverse backgrounds in practicing law is very important for the clients because the clients are so diverse. Right. And if you really want to help them and understand them, I think you have to recognize this diversity and be prepared for it. Absolutely. Well, I think we all agree Having this opportunity to talk with Justice Abramson has been well worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs>